Thank you, Denise. Really good to be with you today. Um, we'll be here for about 40 minutes, 45 minutes, I think, with the um, insights such that they are that I can offer you in terms of my use of Digimap. And the title that I've chosen to talk about today is using Digimap for schools to build a sense of place. Um, I work at the University of Roehampton in southwest London, um, and I teach teachers. Um, so my plan today is to talk to you about my journey with Digimap and the various ways that I've used it, and hopefully these will chime in with some of the ideas that you've got as well. I'm going to be developing the idea of place knowledge um, and what that might be, um, and to run through a series of different ideas of how you could perhaps use Digimap yourself in staff meetings, uh, ways to develop your geographical perspective with Digimap, um, how you could teach explicitly about Scotland. I've got a couple of case studies there of things that I've thought about and things that I've done. I'm going to ask the big question, is Digimap appropriate for Key Stage 1? Because I'll be interested in your thoughts on that. Um, I'll do a little bit on teaching contours, the importance of oblique views, and throw in a bit on field trips as well. So there's all sorts of different bits and bobs I'm going to cover as we go through um, today. Um, so like I say, I work at the University of Roehampton in southwest London. I have lots of connections with some of you on the call, actually, in terms of the Geographical Association and the Early Years and Primary Phase Committee. I've written various things, um, and I'm a part of something called Jog Live, um, which is on YouTube, which is a series of CPD videos that you may have come across through various things on Twitter. But it's really good to connect with you in any way that might be useful um, today or after this as well. So Digimap for schools, what's my journey been? Well, I'll be really honest that when I first came across it, uh, there were various of the tools that I knew of, but I needed some convincing. I needed some convincing that the investment that you might make in this as a yearly subscription would be something that would actually repay uh, benefits. Um, I am now convinced of that, and that's why I'm giving this talk and the perspectives that I've got. Um, I, I do still have a concern that some schools buy into it and they do the um, invoicing and they don't actually use it very much and that they might um, buy it and then not actually do some training with it. Training with the staff team, either from something like Darren Bailey from the Ordnance Survey, certainly here in the UK, um, but also that you don't spend some quality time in a staff meeting looking at Digimap with your staff team. And I'm going to give you at least one insight into a school that I've worked with where, and there were some real penny drop moments when they actually did that quality time with, with the staff team. Um, I'm not a big advocate of necessarily using it just as a display tool, as just using it on the screen. I mean, it's really useful for that, but there's such a lot more to it. And there's such a lot that I can't cover today that has been done in other webinars from other colleagues about how you can really get children to um, interrogate and to add to the Digimap tool that you have access to. So um, I'm not going to cover a lot of that today, but there's such a lot that you can do with Digimap. So it is worth spending time on how you could actually do more with it and learn more with it. Um, I do love it for the offline printing that you can do, uh, printing off extracts, using it for screenshots in PowerPoint slideshows and things like that as a way to compare and contrast. And I really love children scrutinizing those maps in front of them, having them on paper, having extracts with the, um, with the Ordnance Survey grid lines on them so they can really have it in front of them and stand over it rather than having to look at it from some distance on a screen. So I'm a big, big fan of the fact that Digimap does that quite easily because you can print off PDFs without too much of a problem and really centre it on where you want it. The school can be in the centre or a particular landscape or a landform or a landmark could be centred on it. Um, and of course I love it, Digimap for schools, for the quality of the mapping that you get, um, particularly the house to house. Um, I can see exactly where I live in my garage and my um, uh, green space near me um, and you just can't get that quality elsewhere and there may be some other people on the call that remember the good old days where to get this sort of detailed um, close scale mapping you would have to speak to somebody in the local authority and they may send you some paper extracts because this is data that we're all able to access but accessing it through Digimap through this particular app is really really helpful and really really invaluable um, and I do also like seeing Digimap used with a whole class of children. I was in a school just yesterday and they had 30 PCs. And I could just imagine all those children using Digimap for schools at once um, and how wonderful that would be. So it's not just this kind of on the whiteboard, on the screen in front of children display tool where you can't really see a great deal, uh, particularly if you sat at the back of 
class. And I particularly like Digimap now because it's got this integration of the real world geograph images. If you've seen Digimap before, then you've understood what that means. The geograph site is a kind of tried and tested and trusted site of really good images that people have taken from various places within their particular ordnance survey grid square. So I really like that particular aspect um, as well. So on to place knowledge then. So I'm thinking about Digimap for schools and place knowledge and it's worth thinking about the English national curriculum and what our first challenge is, our first aim really. What we're trying to do is to develop contextual knowledge of the world and the defining physical and human characteristics um, and how those then provide a geographical context for the understanding of the actions of processes. So there's quite a lot in that, um, in the aims. So it, it's what specific context are you going to look at in your use of Digimaps? And then what are those physical features, those landforms? And then what characteristics, the way that the buildings are arranged, where those buildings are sited, um, where the roads are sited, where the railways are sited, that then give you a context for having some discussions and maybe setting up some questions for what the actions of particular processes could be. Um, so, so I really want you to kind of start to think about Digimap for Schools is a great tool for you to start to think about how geography is about location, of course it is, but it's also about place and it's about time and particularly with the uh, 1 to 25,000 scale map, if you think about the orange maps that you sometimes see, um, that's a really good way to start to see the processes through time, particularly if you look at the historical images. And I haven't actually got any of the historical images in my slideshow, but um, that's one of the real powerful things to go back to the 1800s, um, to go back to the 1900s in terms of the different map layers that you can use within Digimap. So a sense of place, that's what I'm going to be playing with this idea today. And um, this is something that in the next few slides, I'm going to quote quite extensively from the last couple of years of Ofsted reports on English schools, where they've really said that place knowledge is something that we have not developed perhaps well enough from our perspective in teacher education, but also that we're not passing on to children. We're perhaps getting the idea of location, pinning the map, specific named locations, latitude and longitude, um, four and six figure, eight grid, grid, fig, grid, grid figure references, but we're not getting this sense of place, this, this, this sense of what a place is actually like. So what, is, what does this mean? Well, in, in the quotes that I've, I've picked out, um, place is said to be almost ubiquitous, <laughs> probably unknowable then if it's ubiquitous, but it connects the physical topography and physical or human geography processes with personal experience and I really want to stress that personal experience thing we can't go everywhere we can't run field trips to places but how can you personally connect to um, that particular landscape most children will have seen some sort of water course some ch most children will be able to see some sort of green space near them so how do these other maps of green spaces of a water course a major river or a lake or whatever connect the sorts of places that they can see most children will know of a busy road a main road near them how does that connect to the m1 the m25 the a1 that might be on a digimap for schools map that they might look at um, and continuing this quote it then talks about geographical conceptualization that then brings meaning to the undifferentiated space so i'll be talking a little bit about the kind of space and scale and place as we go through so i'm just going to leave that one hanging a little bit because then this gives meaning to a location and then people's understanding of a place helps to give them a connection that brings together other aspects of geography and then makes it very real. What we want to do, even though this is an aerial view, this is, this is a map, this is something that's not really very contextualised for them, we want to try and make that connection, we want to try and give meaning to them wherever possible and make it as real as possible, even though this is probably going to be quite abstract for them. And most of the time not going to be looking at these maps in... Um, a real location where they can match what they can see in front of them with what's on the uh, paper printout or on the iPad or whatever it is they're, they're looking at. So geographical conceptualization, how does this help teach me about this particular um, location? So place knowledge is a really key concept in the English National Curriculum. We've got these different headings of, of location, pinning the map, 
place knowledge, human and physical features, and then skills and field work. So place knowledge is so key, um, but it's perhaps not built on and developed enough. But it's trying to make these spaces that live these spaces that have meaning, um, these spaces that could be just like any other. Um, a field is a field is a field, a pond is a pond is a pond, a river is a river is a river, but, but how do we make them seem different? How do we point out the differences as well as those similarities between these different um, specific locations? So we ultimately want people to become very spatially aware, so their surroundings become more imbued with this meaning, and then they can hopefully start to transfer this through a range of experience to to other locations because we're trying to provoke what Dory Massey and, and others have talked about this idea of a geographical imagination we're trying to fire it with the exposure to the many millions of maps that we could pull off Digimap a variety of different scales um, and actually the access to Digimap is is ideal for this um, and then we do ultimately want to have some field work. We want to have a chance to visit a location with this specific map um, because we want to get to this place where they can start to transfer this knowledge by just describing what they can see, what they can experience, what they can view, and then maybe transferring it by drawing it, drawing a version of it, drawing a simplified um, map of this location by maybe having it with a lot of the um, locations um, blanked out. Maybe it's a bit like a closed procedure, but on a map where they've got to relabel it based on what they um, experience. Or maybe even writing creatively about it, possibly creating some sort of poetry, some sort of haiku, some sort of ways of coming up with a representation of that knowledge embedded in that map. Often, like describing maps almost as kind of the ultimate knowledge organizer. It's a way to knowledge organize the world. Um, and we need to try and sometimes transcribe that and take that from the map to actually make some sense of it. So I'm aware I'm moving quite, quite swiftly, but I really want to kind of provoke you to look at this map, for example. This is a map I used with a school not so long ago, a map just to the east of London to give you that kind of wider context. Um, and I have to say, we probably spent about half an hour <laughs> as a group of teachers, um, qualified practicing teachers, and we really started to think, okay, where is this? What do we see in this map? What are the significant features? Um, can we use a key? Can we use the um, symbols? Do we know what these symbols mean? And there were a lot of um, conversations about what was there and what wasn't there and um, things to do with contour lines and that's the central line running straight through the middle of that particular image on the London Underground. Um, we talked about FB and what FB might mean as a footbridge, the different sorts of churches that you can see there on the top half of the map, the lack of green space, certainly in that kilometre square and certainly when you watch when you look at Digimap and you see this sort of map extract, this is a 1 to 25,000 scale um, extract, you can really start to see how, actually from that perspective, it's as though there's not much green space. But when you think about all those homes having gardens, maybe those are not connected green spaces. But if you looked at that from an aerial view, if you use the aerial view toggle tool within Digimap, you would see, well, maybe it's 50-50, 50% 50 50 buildings built on, changed, and 50% um, gardens 50 percent green space so sometimes maps don't always tell the truth it looks as though the human has completely dominated that landscape and the humans have certainly dominated even the green spaces because they will have planted and have dug and whatever in their gardens but actually if you look at that in a different way it's probably about 50 50 of, of homes and buildings and roads and railways and whatever else so in this particular example i, I just uh, get you to think about your own square kilometre of where your school is or where your home is at the moment and maybe you've got a map in front of you and you're actually looking at that critically what can you see um what percentages um can you think of in that particular um location um do you really scrutinize the map of where you actually are a place that you know well that you walk through that you drive through that you're constantly within do you really think about what's near um, what's hyper local to you because that's that's the real power of these sorts of quality maps and and like I say the more, longer you look at that it's the kind of underlying geology that then starts to say something to you, you start yeah you start to think well, we are going uphill um, from kind of um, the bottom right to the 
upper um, parts of this map. It is a set of contour lines going uphill. And we start to then think about how, if we walk through this landscape or we drive through this landscape, we perhaps don't notice these things until they're actually pointed out to us. So this is my kind of challenge to you, this square kilometre challenge really because the affordances that these sorts of maps can offer us are very very great and of course the power then is once you've really scrutinized this as a staff and talked about it and thought about it then you can start to really think about similarity with other places in london in other major cities in other cities of the world as well as those differences um as well and this just to give you a bit more context like i say this is east of london on the central line you can see the the um area that we were we were looking at there just in the top right there and you can see the kind of other aspects of the location that you can see with this one to twenty five thousand scale map that i've taken from digimap for schools i've just done a screenshot and like i say i think the real positive of this is that you could have this in front of children and you would get them to really scrutinize it and look at it in some detail um an idea that um, david story and others have talked about is this idea of getting children more aware of through the use of maps like this of of nested hierarchies the fact that your home your school will be in a particular street um, a particular neighborhood in a particular area which will also be part of a, a borough and a town it may be in or near a city and that will be in a county and a region and a country and so on. So it's this place within a place within a place, this kind of Russian doll idea that we're trying to give children an opportunity to have a sense of um, an activity I was doing the other day with student teachers was getting them to write their world address. Can you write your world address? Ending with the universe, solar system, but starting with a chair on a table, in a room, in a building, and trying to develop as many different layers of location as you can to really build up that sense of connection between the fact that you're in the world but you're also in a chair in a room as we speak um so maps help when we zoom in when we zoom out these helpers have these sorts of conversations and clearly this tool as well as other tools um, will give you that opportunity through 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 the internet so just to kind of move us on again if you're ever really struggling in geography to understand so so where is the geography i don't get the geography that i need to teach um because maybe the planning you're using is not very good or you've really not got a great deal of experience it can be very very helpful for you to um know what the potential of geography is by just looking up the digimap for schools map for the area you're looking at now remember that digimap covers the whole world but covers the um three nations of the um, UK, England, Scotland and Wales particularly well in terms of the Ordnance Survey mapping and then there's some good mapping for Northern Ireland but it doesn't quite cover the same um, maps maps there but particularly Great Britain's maps are really really uh, sort of quality that you're seeing there on the screen um, and, and what I'd ask you to do is have that map in front of you a bit like the ones we've just been looking at and use these basic questions that again to some of you will be tried and and tested to try and unpack the story of what the geography is so so what is this location like what why is this location like it is um how is this location changing and how is it connected to other locations through the roads the rails the trams through being able to walk or being able to stop from being walked because of walls and barriers and boundaries and things like that and then what would it feel like to live in this particular um, location so if you start to answer all these you're starting to develop more and more stories of this location you start to develop that place that place place knowledge over time um, and other questions were added to these by marcia foley a number of years ago um, the idea of pinning the map where is this location perhaps compared to others and then how is this area similar or different to other locations um, as well so i always go back to teachers to student teachers and say right start with the map wherever you're teaching about and then go back to these questions if you're finding it tricky and try and work out um, the story of it through talking to others through doing some research through trying to um, connect to it um, so just a couple more perspectives before i give you some more ideas and and tips um, i think sometimes we can put too much emphasis on on looking at a singular map extract without looking at ranges of maps. We need to do quite a lot sometimes with children 
in different age groups, in different units of work, uh, of comparing and contrasting. How is London as a city, and maybe the east of London, compared to Edinburgh? And we'll look at Edinburgh in a little while, because I think Edinburgh is quite a good example of where it really does stand out as having a very dominant physical geographic presence when you look at the Ordnance Survey map on Digimap. So how much zooming in and zooming out are you doing? Because we can't learn to read from just looking at a singular book, so we shouldn't really learn to map read from just looking at one at one map. So we need to have these multiple varied and contrasting contexts to develop this sense of place through maps. But we don't always need to look at them in depth. We don't always need to do them to death. Um, but they should be contrasted all the time from having um, maps on the wall, maps of the UK, maps of the world, Peter's projection maps as well to kind of show different perspectives alongside atlases and, and globes. And particularly, I'd advocate printouts of Digimaps. I know the last school that I left as a teacher, I laminated quite a number of printouts of Digimap style maps and showed them at different scales. And those were just there to use. So you're not always reliant on this technology. You've got printouts that you can just give out. You've got 15 copies of it, one between two, it's laminated so you can go over it with a whiteboard pen so just like you use a whiteboard and you get children holding up whiteboards with answers you're using digimap extracts to annotate and then to use them and to get them to circle things and highlight things and to really use them um, and not just read them in the abstract sense um so Austin are saying, again, quoting from them, we need to have this wide range of up-to-date resources. And Digimap's a great way to have up-to-date resources to develop the locational knowledge and the spatial cognition, the sense of space, and the ability to think about different um, space. Um, and all the time we need to be thinking that we're trying to develop this, this very abstract sense of the world. Um, we're trying to develop their precision and their interconnectedness with um, a sense of place as well. Um, so this is just one other example that I've used where you've got the bottom right, the kind of Digimap for schools, uh, one to 50,000 map, this is. Um, and then we're trying to say, well, actually we're in this um, particular location here of Tunbridge and Morling. Um, you can see it on a Wikipedia map in the top left, and you're seeing a range of other maps, but all these are the same location. They're just zoomed out to a different level. Um, and the children need to have a facility to kind of get these, to understand that these are a place within a place within a place within a place. Um, and that they feature on this. They they they, they are in this place um, where they're going to school. So, again, think, have you got images like this that you're using in school? Are there things that you could develop? Um, so just a couple of other um, quotes there from Ofsted, just to bear in mind that I've picked out, that particularly tie into this idea of place knowledge and relationship to other locations and the idea of um, spatial cognition there it's this cognition as those previous slides just suggested it's not just the micro environment it's the macro environment it's this bigger picture it's this kind of outer edges of the russian doll um, it's not just the small objects that we're trying to um, link to it's the orientation um, near and far and close to as opposed to uh, distant that's what we're trying to really um, get children to understand and it's only through immersion and lots of examples that we're going to get them towards that so another example of a project that i'm doing at the moment this is a school in fulham just by the banks the thames so you can see the thames there at the bottom not far from hammersmith just by putney bridge on the right hand side and this is me using digimap and making screen grabs. This is for a year two class. So this is where I'm really going to be um, thinking through how am I practically using with Key Stage 1 Digimaps at this really kind of close scale. Um, so I've, I've used Digimap and I've done some screen grabs and extracts. And I've knitted them together because we're going to be walking down that um, road there, Bishops Avenue, just by the school. I'm going to be going there on Friday again. And we're going to be looking around the park and I could have um, printed out lots of different maps of the park but I really wanted just to focus on the features I know we're going to see and there was no other but better way of doing this I could think uh, than to kind of do these screen grabs at this this sort of scale but I really do feel that the kind of 
detail of the shape of the road, the shape of the pavement, the shape of the roundabout, the shape of the bowling green and the um, pond. You cannot find that on any other map. The shape of the foreshore and the sorts of things that we'll be able to see if it is low tide. Um, that is going to be so accurate on these sorts of maps. And even with these young children, that's going to be useful to point out. Can you really pinpoint that exact place on the pavement? These are really useful kind of skills. Can we put an X where we think we are? Um, because I could have drawn freehand a map that would show a kind of long road, Bishop's Avenue, it goes to Bishop's Park. I could have drawn the foreshore. I could have done a very simple version of this, but let's, let's aspire with children to kind of use these maps and to try and orientate it um, correctly, to try and think about where north and south and east and west is. Obviously, I've moved it around a little bit, so that's actually quite hard to tell. But I'd want to put a key. I'd, I'd want to put a north, um, south, east, west um, compass rose on there for them but this is just one way that i've kind of played with digimap more recently um kind of manipulated it a little bit if you like um, but the real joy and i'm sure most of you will be aware of this is the the real joy of seeing your house number seeing the shape of your home the size of your home sometimes you really do realize why um your neighbor's got a bigger bay window to you because the house is just wider than yours and there's a real accuracy again and a real level of detail here which um certainly for key stage two is really really helpful but even for younger children and um, if your school has a quite a small catchment area it will on a map like this have pretty much all of the homes on which they live and the shape of their garden whether they've got a garage or not and again the grass verges and things like that that other maps really just don't don't pick up and you can see an example here on fleece road um what's there is there two significant trees there is that why those have been picked out are they different sorts of trees there's a real geographical investigation to to to, to look at that when you look at these um in detail um and of course there's all sorts of tools as you're aware you can see on the left hand side measurement tools you could work out with older children couldn't you the area of that particular grass verge there you can see on fleece road the area of the school playing field the area of the tarmac playground and so on there's all sorts of things that you could do which i won't go into now but there's such a sense of wonder there that you can actually pinpoint where you live you can pinpoint your road you can pinpoint your particular hyperlocal um, geography and so just to move on again some of the other things that i particularly like about um digimap is sometimes thinking about key stage one again um again this is me advocating that there are some opportunities for using um this within key stage one although that's a one to fifty thousand scale map and it's really quite confusing to look at there are some things to do with color and shape and the fact that it's the coast and that it's the port that i do think if you gave that as an extract to print out to children in key stage one that they could navigate maybe you could cut it up maybe you could make a jigsaw of it and put the pieces back together and through doing that children could talk and really explain um how edinburgh is and what it's like and use some of those storm inquiry questions but i think there's such an opportunity here to really focus on these extinct volcanoes to focus on um arthur's seat and hollywood park you can see there and there's such a lot of language there which again could be a barrier to some children i'm quite aware of that but particularly when you look at some of the other scale map i mean just look at some of the words here haggy snow no or no um Dumby Dykes, Powder House Corner, Echoing Rocks, The Lion's Horse, Lion's Haunch, um, Dunce Peak. It's almost lyrical, isn't it? I mean, there's definitely, again, poetry that could come from this. Cat Nick, The Hunter's Bog, The Dassies. Um, it's not so much the reading of the landscape. It's just using that place name etymology of, of what and why and how. And there's definitely stuff that could be done even with younger children to kind of get a sense of place there of these more wild spaces in these um, key stage one locations we need to study we need to study the four nations of the uk we need to study the cities do we just do the royal mile do we just do the built environment or do we sometimes focus on the physical environment as well there's certainly something there that we could start to get across them the awe and wonder of that Another example that I'd share with Scotland, um, this was shared most recently in a Jog Live webinar that myself and colleagues from the early years and primary phase committee did. Um, you can scan that QR code and get to that directly. Um, this was an example of where I was using Digimap to talk about Kraken, the hollow mountain, not far from Oban. And this was to look at the example of hydropower to try and generate 
um, electricity from water. Um, so we start off with this kind of much zoomed out map to a scale of 100 kilometers. You can see there in the bottom right hand corner from Digimap. We start to narrate a story of zooming into um, the Scottish nation, seeing the different uh, mountains, the Grampian Mountains and the Southern Uplands, and we get pupils to then focus on the area we're going to look at, that area between Oban and Kirinlarik. And again, we're using these perhaps on the screen this time to narrate this kind of difference in these different scale maps. Again, focusing on Oban, focusing on Krenlarik, where might you put this hydroelectric plant? Where might you put this place where the water will fall down the mountainside and will start to generate electricity from driving these turbines? And again, I'll ask the children to focus on um, Oban and Krenlarik and that road, the A85. Um, and that's where we're going to be particularly looking just at the head of Loch Awe. Um, and again, there's such, I mean, that particular map, I think is just a wonderful map in terms of green space and high mountains and uh, the ferries and such a lot in that one particularly if you're looking at it in terms of key stage two that really gives a very different view to Scotland than you would get from other mapping um, providers um, again another different scale map to five kilometers there um, again focusing on this um, A85 between Cranlarick and, and Oban and we're really focusing now on that central place there, Ben Kraken, Kraken Mountain and the Kraken uh, Reservoir that you can see there um, at about 900 metres above sea level. Um, and I won't go into this in great detail, but but it's worth just looking at the full um, webinar that I did elsewhere on this particular example of using these different scales of map to really give that sense of place zoomed out and then zoomed in um, that gives that um, good view, different view of these particular locations and particularly when you get to the level you can see the contour line you can see why you would put a reservoir there and you would um, make that somewhere that you could trap all that water um, ready to open up the sluice gates open up the sluice gates to run the turbines and create this um, amazing james bond style hollow mountain where you would drive these turbines to create hydroelectric power within 30 seconds as soon as people turn on their kettle at the end of Strictly Come Dancing or Coronation Street or whatever. Um, but really important that they get a sense of place through images as well. And clearly um, you could use the geograph element of Digimap to give you that um, as as well. Um, so that's an example of virtual field work, um, but I want to perhaps move on just in the final few um, slides to focus on field trips that you can do from school. Um, and again, focusing on this idea of sense of place that can be developed from um, the story of a location. Um, and again, quoting from the most recent Ofsted geography report of 50 or so schools, I think it was that um, what they said was that field trips have been conflated with field work and leaders believed that pupils were doing field work as they simply went out of school, but they were often not doing any geographical work in the places they visited. So I can't read between the lines here, but it may be that they're not scrutinizing these maps. They're not looking at the maps. They're not really thinking about those maps and the opportunities there because these particular pupils as reported were, were not learning how to observe, to measure and record and present geographical information about these places. There was no geographical question that they were seeking to answer through the visit. So maybe this teacher wasn't thinking about um, an inquiry wasn't thinking about an opportunity to ask a, a question, an open question about the area, probably an open question that they do know the answer to. It would be um, very much a focused or a framed and possibly a facilitated inquiry, but there is an opportunity there to really not just go out for the sake of it. It's not a field trip, but it's actually field learning, field work, field study, maybe, um, because there may be some specific skills that the teachers might actually want them to develop. So again, Digimaps, maps in general can really help you develop these um, senses of place, these, these opportunities to develop um, meaningful um, field trips. And sometimes this can be to do with the height of land and uh, forgive me there for not using a Digimap, but it's a really great um, opportunity to kind of compare and contrast with Digimap, with the contour lines, with um, maps like this one, the topographic maps that you can see. Um, and you can see how different really 
the upland areas are of Britain from the Pennines north, really, in terms of being so much higher above sea level than these much lower, um, much um, more prone to flooding um, areas south of that and certainly east east of that. So have a look at topographicmaps.com because the idea that we live on slopes, the idea that we live on very up and down land should be really obvious to us because, as Anderson has argued, much of the terrestrial surface of our planet is sloping, has been affected by, by ice, by water or land movement in one form or another. And again, something that I've done with schools, this is another example from South London, close to Croydon, this one. Um, I was working in this school once and again looking at this kilometre square from the Oldman survey from Digimat and saying so 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 what is the, what's the opportunity here for teaching about geography and, and those teachers hadn't particularly thought about the fact that they were on the top of a hill um, the fact that um, right opposite them was the A232 um, and then you have this sloping field that goes from a kind of terrace of 60 meters above sea level to 55 to 50 and, and the steepness of that slope everybody was aware of it everybody hauled themselves up and down that from time to time um, but it really wasn't a key part of their um, teaching the fact that there's a valley there it's the Wandle Valley um, that goes all the way to um, various um, boroughs of London and then into the Thames the fact that this is part of the catchment area of this river that feeds the Thames that hadn't really come across to them when they thought about where they are in the world, their specific um, location. So again, it's worth thinking about where you're living, where you're teaching, and what do the contour lines that will be on a 1 to 25,000 map like this on paper or on screen through Digimap um, can actually offer you in terms of opportunities. Now, like I say, so often they're hidden because of all the buildings on top, and you need to kind of screw up your eyes and really scrutinise them, but there's such a lot of opportunity, particularly if it's an open space like this, for the children to go and stand there and see the view, to stand there and really think about where the steepest part of that hill is, and maybe go and stand where they think um, 60 is and 55 and 50. That could be another good um, investigation for children to do and they could, I could really imagine them being out there using that map extract and orientating themselves about where they might be um, in the world. And then of course making that contrast to places like Glencoe where those contour lines are so different. This is a 1 to 50,000 scale map but again you compare that square kilometer with all the homes with the kind of interesting circular arrangement of homes there in the bottom corner comparing those contour lines and the kind of width of those to these ones where you go from sea level to in effect 900 meters very very quickly um and that that to you without the photograph attached to it will not mean a great deal necessarily but if any of you know glencoe and the amazing mountains that you have there when you start to compare and contrast that to the images that you can see and really understanding what those um, landforms that are picked out there look like in practice there's a real opportunity there with using a map extract like this and particularly their bottom right I mean that viewpoint there what does that viewpoint look like could you imagine if you were looking um, towards the south or towards the southwest um, what would you actually see um, so such a lot of opportunity like I say comparing and contrasting urban areas um, versus rural areas versus really kind of remote areas with very little there apart from a8 to passing through it, an amazing road to drive through, um, but really quite desolate at times of the year, really quite dangerous as well. So lots of questions could kind of flow from that in terms of what your region is like, how those different valleys are formed, whether they're V-shaped or U-shaped and so on. Um, and particularly I'd advocate there, one of the final ideas is to use drone footage, to use video footage to get that kind of um, 360 degree view and that's perhaps again where you would um, use something like google earth to really have that perspective as well but using google earth with a map like this i think is so valuable to kind of pick out those 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 features so this is the final tip really um, of using digimap using the ordnance survey mapping that you can get there and then finding drone footage either that somebody else has found for you often you'll find on youtube people having lots of drone clips there having drone clips that they've possibly without asking permission or having a license but they're able to film them when they got their drone for christmas um, and you'll start to see the lie of the land and the landscape and the 
layout of that particular road or golf course or that particular estate and and matching that and comparing that to the ordnance survey mapping and seeing if you can pick out those green spaces those landmarks those water courses is really really helpful so aerial views directly above bird's eye is important but oblique view from the side is such a powerful way of seeing that landscape and seeing those slopes seeing those hills seeing those mountains um, as well you really do get a sense of awe and wonder um, and penny drop moments when you see those sorts of things so just just as i finish do be thinking of some some questions um i hope you've stayed with me through the 40 or so minutes that i've been um talking um one strong recommendation from a good colleague of mine dr paula owens and the ordnance survey is their teaching map skills booklets that you can get to from these qr codes on the screen um there's an early years one published um last year i think it was um and one that was published the year before for five to eleven but if you wanted a sense of progression in using digimap type maps using ordnance survey maps printed out or on paper um, these are really really invaluable documents to uh, to use to help to skill your staff up if you're doing these staff meetings in um, using Digimaps, uh, really full of inspiring ideas and, and a real sense of a curriculum for using maps, a curriculum for using um, locational and place knowledge um, in practice. So that's all I had to um, speak about. Um, so I do invite any questions and thoughts and perspectives from you. Um, hope that was some use to you all.